How are Nisha? How are you? Hi, Aurora. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for joining me today. So mm. I want to start off by getting just who you are in some of your academic journey. Okay, so my name is Wanisha. I am originally from Waco, Texas. Um, I graduated from high school in Port Gibson, Mississippi, and I stayed in Mississippi for undergrad. I went to Tougaloo College, which is in HBCU um, in Tougaloo, Mississippi, and they had a partnership program with Brown University, so I applied to medical school during my sophomore year of undergrad and was accepted, and I ended up at Brown for medical school, so now I am in the process of applying for residency. I don't know where I'll end up at, but um, I'm pretty much interviewing like all over the place right now. That's awesome. I'm not sure the demographics of Port Gibson High, so can you talk about it and describe the transition from Port Gibson High to Tougaloo? Well, Port Gibson is predominantly African-American um, population, and the high school I went to was predominantly African-American. Um, a lot of um, my other counterparts went to the private school also um, in Port Gibson because it's still pretty much segregated in the sense that um, everything is separate. So the high schools are separate. Even where we live um, is separate. So um, transitioning to Tulu wasn't that much different because I went to high school with um, um, predominantly African-American. So Tougaloo actually felt like home to me because I was around people um, that I could relate to, that could relate to me. You know, we had shared experiences. So um, that transition wasn't that bad, but um, transitioning from Tougaloo to Brown was definitely an eye-opener. Um, an eye-opener in what way? Can you describe it? Like, I, I understand where you're going because we both transitioned from Tougaloo to Brown and in a lot of ways it was a culture shock, but I would like to hear a little bit more about your experience. Yes, just everything was just so different. Um, starting with, you know, just the people that I was around. I wasn't used to being in spaces where I was the minority. So transitioning to Brown, I was in that space. Um, and so I had to find um, my community within that space. And it was really hard because I didn't know anybody from Rhode Island. I had never, like, me coming to Rhode Island was the first time I was in the North, um, particularly the Northeast. Um, so I had to find my community within that space, which was really hard. Um, but even just the food was different. Coming from the South, you know, all of our food cooked with, you know, the good lard or butter, um, everything fried. You can fry just about anything. Um, and so coming to Rhode Island, it just was different. There was just so many different cultures, um, so many different foods to try, um, which to me, I really enjoy because I'm definitely a big foodie. So I, that's what I really loved about Rhode Island. But it definitely was a culture shock. Um, and even just the, um, the mentality. I feel like Rhode Island is more liberal um, in terms of just, you know, the things that are there and the people that are there versus like coming from Mississippi where it's pretty conservative and pretty religious. Um, so it was just different. Um, I was homesick for a while because I'm like, I don't, I just didn't feel like I fit in at all. Um, but I think it started to grow on me a little bit because then I felt like I was in spaces where I could thrive and where I could, you know, be a little bit more open-minded about everything. So. And so what were the spaces that you began to feel more comfortable? Like, how did you find these spaces? Were these spaces like predominantly black people or people of color? Just like, how did you navigate being so uncomfortable to finding spaces that felt, you know, more relevant and rele relevant to you? Well, when I came to Brown for the first time in undergrad, um, I think they have a building on campus. I don't know the name of it now, but it's a building on campus where you can go and it's uh, for the students of color um, at Brown. Um, and so I went there probably like the first month I was at Brown just to like show my face and introduce myself to people. Um, but then I was trying to get my hair braided one time and I reached out to someone and I was like, do you know someone who braids hair at Brown? And they um, 
recommend, recommended me to a person and, you know, I just got to know that person and she was also going to medical school. And so I was like, well, hey, I need to, you know, stay in contact with you um, because, you know, we'll be classmates soon. And she introduced me to um, other people of color at Brown. Um, and so once I got to medical school, I had already known a few people there because I had met them when I was um, at Brown for my semester away. Um, so it was just a little bit easier to build that community during medical school because I had already known those people. Yes. And so you are in medical school now. Can you talk about what inspired you to go to medical school and specifically what it's also what inspired you to get a master's in primary care and population? You know, everyone always be like, well, when I was younger, I wanted to be a doctor. But for me, that was not my experience. Um, when I was younger, I kind of wanted to be everything. Um, <laughs> it just, I don't know. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor. I like, I wanted to be everything. Um, and I really didn't have that mentorship or that background growing up anyway to be like, oh, well, this is something cool. Like, let me go shadow a doctor or, you know, um, maybe I have a doctor in my family that I can like reach out to. So I didn't have any of those things growing up. And even when I got to high school, when I graduated high school, you know, in my head, I had this idea that I wanted to be a doctor, but I still didn't even know how to get there. And, you know, fortunately for me, I ended up at Tougaloo, which, you know, produces a lot of the Black doctors um, in the state of Mississippi. So um, once I got there, I was able to learn more about it. Um, but my journey to medicine just has been rooted in wanting to help people. Um, knowing that we are at higher rates for mortality caused by heart disease or, you know, just lack of proper um, care, health care. Um, and so that's really what has been just motivating me all this time to, you know, continue my journey in medicine. But what really interested me in getting this master's in primary care and population medicine was being a Jackson Heart Study Scholar um, because we, you know, we learned a lot about um, public health and we learned about cardiovascular disease in the African-American community. And we learned about um, inequities in healthcare. We just learned about so many things. And so I wanted to get a MPH um, once I graduated from Tougaloo, but I learned about this program at Brown. And so it is built on the framework of an MPH, but it also includes a clinical component, which I thought was like super important to me because I want to, um, make that impact in the clinical settings. Like I wanna to get to know my patients and I wanna have longer longitudinal relationships with them. And then I wanna understand what's needed from the community. So, you know, that hopefully it's something that I can incorporate into my future practice to make sure that I'm addressing those needs. So that's why I ended up choosing that particular program. Awesome. So going to Tougaloo, being in Jackson Heart Study Program, you know, we learned a lot about the mistrust for, held by people of color, specifically Black people, for medicine and researchers. Has that played a role in any of the activities or activism and advocacy work that you have done as a medical student so far? Yes. <laughs> uh, short answer, yes. Long answer, um, we still see it today. Like, we still see this mistrust and... Um, one thing that really opened my eyes as a, a Jackson Heart Study Scholar, we had to take an ethics class. And as part of the ethics class, they took us to Tuskegee. And we got to, you know, learn about, well, we already knew about it, but we got to learn more about the Tuskegee syphilis trials and things like that. But I think the most impactful part of that trip was meeting the descendants of the men who were, um, affected in that um, study and and it just and I think it's just I'm always thinking about okay I want to make sure that people are making informed decisions I want to make sure that people know what resources are, are out there for them and how to access those resources so as a medical student I spend a lot of time just like educating and advocating patients like you know these are the resources that you have available to you this is what's going on with you. You know, if you have other questions, once you get home and read through these things, you know, please don't hesitate to, you know, contact us again so we can talk more about this or even just making follow-up appointments two weeks later, just when you're giving someone like really um, tough information um, that, you know, they may have trouble 
understanding or dealing with just like making sure you're making those follow-up appointments and also just um advocating so one of my medical school classmates and I were working on a video series for African-American women experiencing pregnancy um, because we understand you know like African-Americans are at a higher risk of maternal mortality um, so we want to make sure that we are educating them about their you know rights as a patient you know what resources are available to them you know creating a birth plan like when we realized like how many people did not even know that they could be part of creating their birth plan, like, okay, we need to do something about this. So um, a few of my classmates and I, we got together to create this PowerPoint that we're now going to turn into a video series just so that we can provide this education to um, women everywhere. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the advocacy work that you have done in regards to food deserts and the community that that was done in and how did it start because yeah, I'm reading your biography and it says that during your time in medical school um, you consistently advocated for nutrition and food insecurity health disparities lack of access to proper health care in underserved communities and diversity oh yeah yeah um, so actually it was food insecurity among medical students. Um, yeah, so Brown had did this overall survey to, you know, uh, I guess to just see if there was any food insecurity among, you know, the undergraduates and graduate students at Brown. But then we realized that, uh, the medical students were not, um, adequately represented in the data that was collected. And so we um, decided that we wanted to do it for the medical school. And we learned that a, a high um, portion of medical students actually experienced food insecurity. And so we they developed a task force. Um, it consisted of students, it consisted of deans of the medical school, it consisted of um, professors and um, community advocates that came together to see like, how can we address these problems? Because it was an issue that they didn't even know existed. Um, but, you know, talking with other medical students, you know, sometimes people had to choose between paying for, a question bank to study and buying food for the month, or they had to choose between paying their bills for the month, given that we're not, you know, a lot of people don't have time to work an actual job because the, um, the stresses of medical school is already enough without adding, you know, other things on top of that. And so people will have to choose between paying bills and buying food. And so um, that work, that is my work with food insecurity came um, from that and so it's something that we're still working on because it's a real issue and I know that it's not um, limited to brown I'm sure that this is an issue nationwide it's an issue under with um, among undergraduates it's an issue among like other graduate students and other professional programs and um, and I think we tend to not think that it's an issue because we think oh well these people are they're, they have enough money to be able to be in this particular program or be out here getting this degree that they shouldn't have food problems, but um, definitely think it's a bigger issue than we know. So did you guys come up with a solution to the problem, like to that issue? So it's still a work in progress, um, but one thing that I know um, that the medical school does is for students um, during the third and fourth year, we can apply for um, food delivery from Stop and Shop. And so they give us a uh, voucher to cover the delivery cost because it's a delivery cost associated with that. Um, so that's another barrier. And then once we're in our third and fourth year and we're doing clinical rotations, another barrier is just having the time to be able to go to the grocery store and buy food and have time to also prepare that food. So um, by covering that cost, you know, it, it allows more people access to be able to do food delivery and everything. Um, and it also gives um, a discount um, on like your total food price. And so I think that was just like another barrier, but it's still a work in progress. Um, at one point, Brown was doing um, 
uh, food service and we had a location near the medical school, but that location was shut down. And so people would have to go up to the undergrad campus to get their food. But that was like another obstacle because, you know, sometimes we were, we were not leaving the hospital until after um, it was past the time to pick up your food. And so that was another obstacle. So we're still working on those things, you know, maybe having something like a food pantry at the medical school to, you know, provide like food for people who um, are facing food insecurity or, you know, just having like the refrigerator stocked with food that people can take. Um, so those are all ideas that we, we have thrown out there. And so I think we're just still trying to like figure it out. And was it equal amongst the, like equal amongst the different ethnicities within medical school that they were struggling with food insecurities about the same or was there like a disparity seen there as well? Um, I don't know that information off the top of my head. I would have to go back and um, look through all the surveys that were submitted to see, because I'm not sure if we um, provided that analysis um, to that level. Um, and so I'll have to go back and actually look and see because I, that's definitely an interesting um, thing to look at as well. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking about some of the conversations I've had so far. And what I hear a lot is that there are like resources, resource disparities that exist for students of color that are in medical school. And some of it is even like how you mentioned earlier, not shadowing before you or like not shadow starting some of it is even like when you start to shadow. So some people start to shadow in high school because they have relatives that are doctors and that kind of stuff. And so I'm just wondering, did, did those effects linger into food insecurities? And did you see any other like lack of resources as a medical student that you did not predict having? Um, yes, even just going back to the reason, like the... Um resource of just like not shadowing you know we have people don't shadow as early or they don't have as much shadowing experience my first shadowing experience came when I started medical school and you know that's not really a good time to find out like hey I really do like this or hey I don't really like this um I volunteered in a hospital but it wasn't shadowing an actual doctor um so not not having shadowing experiences um, not having the proper resources. So a lot of people use um, question banks to study for our exams and to study for our board exams. And, you know, they're very expensive. And so you come in and some people come in, start using those things first year because they have that knowledge of, you know, someone before them, whether it was a family member, a friend that they've known in medical school or a family friend who's a doctor telling them to like, hey, you need to really start using this resource early so that you can prepare for your board exam and you can make a great score on your board exam. Um, but students of color are disproportionately um, behind when it comes to those things because they don't have that knowledge of, you know, saying like, hey, you need to buy this or even it comes to a cost thing, you know, you know, some people, a lot of people are in medical school on scholarship. And so now you're adding an additional cost for all of these different resources and, you know, trying to make sure that we're keeping up with everyone else, making sure we're using all the same resources. And you can be you're looking at like two, three thousand dollars just for question banks and books and um, study materials. So, you know, that was um, a disparity as well. And you know, just connections of people in medicine. Um, when I came into medicine, I really, the only thing that I really knew about was family medicine. And so I didn't know that, you know, what if I wanted to go into orthopedics or, you know, dermatology, I should have been doing research my first year, um, you know, to make myself a more, um, um, like to make competitive my, applicant. Yeah, to make myself a more competitive applicant um, in the future. I mean, luckily, I don't want to go into orthopedics or dermatology, but or any uh, field where, you know, that was the case. But, you know, for those students of color who did, you know, not having that information early on kind of hindered them during medical school. And so um, it's really, it's, it's a lot of things um, that put students of color um at a disadvantage when it comes to medical school. And I think 
that's why I'm really glad to be talking about it with you because I think, you know, medical school is already hard and like now students of color, you know, we have to deal with all of these other things on top of trying to get a, a medical education and it just makes the journey so much harder than, you know, it really should be. Yeah. And so just in your opinion, how do you think you start to level the playing field? Like, how do you, you know, we can go back and change our family dynamics, our family history, what they decide to go into, the resources that they had and that limited them from not pursuing like degrees in medicine and all that kind of stuff. But from where we are now, what do you think it will take to kind of level the playing field where everyone starts off on kind of even footing? know if we will ever level that playing field but what we can do to try to um help the next generation or you know the ones coming up after us is i definitely think mentorship plays a big role into that and so you know just um creating those spaces and having those spaces um where people or people of color who wants to go into medicine that they can reach out to someone who is in medicine or you know is currently going through that process so that they can know what to do starting early on like should I be shadowing now that I'm in high school should I be um buying this question bank my first year versus my second year of medical school um how should I prep for the MCAT should I take this uh, course for the MCAT or should I take that course you know just like having those spaces. And I don't even think just for like medical school, it's just, you know, school in general, you know, any professional school, um, any graduate school, um, the workforce, because, you know, is is I think this disadvantage exists across the continuum. It's not just, you know, isolated um, in academia, but, you know, just having those spaces, because I know for me, the one thing that has been super, super helpful for me is mentorship. And, you know, that kind of started for me in undergrad. And I've had my same mentors from undergrad. I still have them now. And then I've picked up mentors in um, medical school that I, I'm i pretty sure will I will use them in the next phase of my life when I start residency. And, I, you know, and I will continue picking up uh, mentors as I go through. Um, but that's not something that I had before undergrad. So just creating those spaces that we can start um, catching people younger and we can you know make that process just a little um more seamless and less daunting than it is now absolutely um so you were just speaking about mentoring and how important mentoring has been for you and I think that's a great segue into some of the organizations that you have started to engage and mentor young women specifically in Claiborne County and Port Gibson area um so can you Tell us a little bit about Girls With Vision and Hometown Heroes. Yes, okay, so Girls With Vision is a mentoring um, group for adolescent girls. Um, and it was started because my co-founder and I, we were just talking about you know, how we wish we would have had that mentorship in high school. Um, about life things, about our, you know, furthering our education and all of those type of things. And so we got together and we came up with the idea for Girls with Visions. And so the mission for Girls with Visions is just to provide a space to talk about all of the things that can occur during the adolescent years and, you know, making sure that um, the girls in the community are um, physically, um, um, their physical well-being, their emotional well-being, their um, academic well-being, like make sure that they have the resources to excel in all of those areas. Um, and so we paired them up with a mentor in a community. And so they have their own relationship to where, you know, if they need someone to talk to about, you know, we try to pair it up based on like um, career aspirations and things like this. So, you know, if they wanted to have someone to talk, you know, like, how do I get to the next step if I want to do this? And so pairing them with someone that can be a good mentor for them to do that. Um, and then, you know, we also have like the large group things just to build like community among them and, um, and just create that space where we can just talk about like a lot of things about, you know, uh, life changes that happen during adolescent years and like high school and bullying and, you know, preparing for college. So just providing them that space for girls with visions. Um, 
Hometown Heroes, which is a nonprofit organization, um, is um, Hometown Heifers um, Empower Revitalizing and Optimizing Everyone's Success uh, was founded uh, based off an idea. So I contacted one of my co-founders and I had this idea for a week-long summer camp because, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I didn't have exposure to the healthcare field in high school. And there's many other fields that we didn't have exposure to um, during that time. And I thought it would just be um, a great opportunity to uh, provide them exposure to different things. And so um, my co-founder was telling me about someone else that wanted to do a literacy camp because that's another thing that affects the um, African-American community. You know, our literacy rates are lower um, than our other counterparts. And so we got together and we developed this and it, uh, originally it was supposed to be like a week-long thing, but it ended up being like a two-day thing called a summer experience for me and me stand um, for mindfulness and exploration. And so the first day we did mental health. And so we had um, a mental health counselor come in and talk with them. Then we did an activity where they had to choose like song, a song and choose like song lyrics. And they had to explain why they related to those song lyrics. And when I tell you that was just like the most eye-opening experience because those kids were going through some deep things. And I'm like, was I really going through these type of things in high school? And I didn't have this outlet to like express myself or feel like I had someone to talk to about these type of things. Um, and so we did mental health, we covered um, physical health. So they did Zumba and then we, um, and the second day it was, um, you know, we talked a lot about like COVID. They got to like make them some lungs in a bottle just to like do some anatomy and physiology. And then we ended it with the career fair and the college fair. And so we just had people from different careers, like firefighter. We had like a, a few of the colleges in the areas come through. We had um, um, mental health. Um, uh, we had a therapist there. We had a lab technician there we just we wanted to expose them to different careers because I mean I'm in medicine and I would love for everyone to be in medicine but I know that everyone doesn't want to go into medicine um but I also know that you know it's just it's careers out there that we don't have exposure to so we don't know it's out there how can we um aim to get to those places and then we ended with a Juneteenth celebration um and it was it was like I don't know that was probably the highlight because the law had just been passed to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. And so we had the Juneteenth celebration right after that. And so it was um, it was really great and it was for the community. So Hometown Hero, we aim to just engage more with the Claiborne County community um, and not just the children population, but the adult population and the elderly population because we wanna make sure that everyone's well-being is um, being taken care of. That is an awesome experience for people. I'm so glad that you were able to initiate those kind of activities and serve your community in that way. That is, that is awesome. Um, so can you give some advice? Like, I know for Hometown Heroes, it's more about the community and whole, like elderly, young, just whoever needs and wants to participate in the activities that you had available. But going back to Girls With Vision, you were speaking about oh, I wish that I had some of these outlets when I was younger because I don't know if I was going through this much stuff. So for people who don't have an outlet outlet like Girls With Vision, can you just give some advice or tips for anybody, like any young women that may be going through a hard time because of the woes of adolescence, like breakups or, you know, struggling with family dynamics, puberty, all those kinds of things, just like any advice, tips or encouraging words? My advice is find your person. I think um, my person just happened to be my aunt. Um, and um, and I think that's why we're so close now because when I was going through all of those things, like I didn't have anybody else to turn to. And so I turned to my aunt um, and we kind of went through those things together. But, you know, just like find your person. Um, it's a lot to try to deal with on your own. And, you know, and if you keep bottling all of the emotions that you're having, all of the, you know, disappointments and heartaches and heartbreaks, and you just keep that to yourself. It gets hard to deal with it. And, um, and the longer that you don't address the situation, the harder it is to um, heal from the situation. Um, so 
my advice is, you know, find a person, talk about it. If you, if you're not a talker, talker, um, journal about it. Um, I am a big advocate for seeing a therapist or a counselor. Um, that's what helped me get through, um, a lot of the things that I was going through, um, undergrad and medical school and now, um, so I am a big advocate for that. Um, but it's hard and it's not something that you should try to tackle on your own. Yeah. So you made me think of two questions, but the, I asked the first one, which is, you said to find your person, but I think one thing, and it may not be something that everybody struggles with, but like, you know, me personally am kind of like an introverted person. And so when it comes to assessing like who I want to be a mentor and actually facilitating or starting those first conversations and nurturing those uh, relationships to have like lifelong mentors and connection what do you recommend like how do you recommend someone initiate it first like via email via text just walking up to somebody like what would you say just a like a very general like I want you to mentor me because x y and z and some tips for nurturing those relationships um I am definitely that person too I, I'm like I I don't know, I get anxiety asking people to be like my mentor or things like that. Um, but a lot of my mentorships have come through just like small talks at like events and things. And, you know, I would make small talk and they'd be like, oh, here's my information to contact me. Um, but if there is a person that, you know, like you look up to or a person um, that you see is always in the community, because the people that want to be mentors, I feel like they place themselves in positions that people know like hey this is a person that I think I look up to that I would like to mentor me and so I, I have found that those people are you know easy to um contact and get to know so you know if it's a person um that you are saying like I really would like to you know um be this person's mentee just reach out to them you know email I'm not a big phone person I, I have I get heart palpitations cold calling people so it's easier for me to just send an email or a text message so you know just communicating with them in some type of way um and if you're like in a space where you know it's an event or something going on just you know you know you don't have to say a lot you could just walk up to this person and say like it's like if they were a speaker you could just walk up to them and say like hey I really like what you said up there I really resonated with that you know um and it would be great if we could talk more about that or if they wasn't a speaker and they were just there and, you know, you just overhear a conversation or something that they're saying, you know, just, you know, let naturally um, allow the conversation to happen. You know, don't don't seem, you know, make it forceful. But I feel like the people that want to be mentors, they they put themselves in position to like make other people feel um, welcome to approach them and how to nurture those relationships. Um, when you have a great mentor-mentee relationship, it, it kind of nurtures itself because, you know, I don't talk to my mentors every day, but if I'm going through something, I know that I can pick up my phone or I can send an email and say, hey, this is happening. Can you give me some advice? Um, and they all respond, you know, really well or sometimes they'll even just reach out to me and say like hey Wayneesha I haven't heard from you in a while like is everything okay and even if I don't respond I think they know that like I'm busy or I have like a lot going on in medical school and so they don't like take and when I respond two or three weeks later you know it's it's no issue um but you know just making sure that you know you build that connection up front and you just get to know that person and you allow that person to get to know you and if you're an introvert um <laughs> like myself in Aurora here um you know it doesn't have to be you know all just talking you know just you know find something you I don't know like find something that you both like to talk about or you both like to do because I know Aurora went to like spin we were talking about going to spin classes with one of our mentors that we have in common and I mean I don't really like spin class but she's like she made it seem like it was the best thing in the world and I'm like I would do this yeah, but you are active, like you like active stuff. So it would be something that like 
you would be interested in and I would be interested in. So it was like and it doesn't require us to talk, but like we could do the activity together and we can like bond in that moment. And maybe afterwards we would just like, oh my gosh, that was so hard. Or I don't ever want to do that again in my life or I want to do it again in my life, you know, but just like, you know, that something like that will give us opportunity to bond, but without like having to just like talk the entire time and just be like in an awkward space. And I feel like when you continue to do those things, like, the relationship will be more organic and it will it will sustain itself. Absolutely. And the second thing that I heard you mention um, was you started to speak a little bit about how you take care of yourself and, and even in the ME program, summer program that you held the first, uh, well, it stands for mindfulness and exploration. Mm -hmm. And so I love the idea of mindfulness. So I just want you to speak a little bit about your self-care. So do you have a self-care journey? Where did it start? And what does it look like today? Of course, I have a self-care journey. Oh my goodness, this <laughs> is like my favorite thing to talk about. Um, so I created my chosen way. Um, as a way to just talk about my self-care journey and to just encourage other people to start their self-care journey. Um, my journey started in medical school. Um, I had a really rough first year. I was ready to drop out. I was like, I have no idea what's happening. Um, and I started going to therapy again. And a lot of people think the first therapist you have is going to be your match. I went through like three therapists before I got to my person. I'm like, okay, I really relate to her. And I feel like she relates to me. Um, and one of the first things she asked me, she was, what do you do for yourself? And I'm like, I don't know. I cook for myself. I go to the gym. She's like, but like, is that what you do for yourself? Like what makes you happy? And I did not have an answer for that question. I was like, I have no idea what makes me happy. I, I thought I was happy, but obviously I'm not happy. Um, and so my first six months in therapy with her, it was literally just finding things that I like that could make me happy. Um, and I finally settled on taking myself to the movies every week. So every Friday I would take myself um, pre-pandemic every Friday I would take myself to the movies and I would just watch a movie I would go by myself I didn't even have to go with the person because it got to the point where I was so happy doing that like you know go to the movies get you a, a get me an icy give me a bucket of popcorn and I would just like watch the movie by myself and so I feel like that was really the beginning of like my self-care journey um and so now I make it my mission <laughs> to do something for myself if I'm not doing it every week I do something for myself every other week so whether that's like scheduling a monthly massage or scheduling a monthly facial or you know just going to the salon to get my um get a manicure and a pedicure um I don't too much go to the movies anymore um you know since the pandemic has started but I still watch movies so um, if a new movie come out and it's on HBO Max or, you know, something like that, I will, uh, just grab me some popcorn and, and I don't get ices, but you know, something and snacks. Yeah. 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 Just get my snacks and things. And I like sit and watch the movie because that really is my happy place. Like no matter what I have going on in my life, if I sit down with my snacks and I'm watching a movie, I'm like happy. It's like nothing that can like disturb that peace that I feel in that moment. Um, and so, and also, so what I do now, so I started it last year, I reached out to like a few of my friends and I was like, Hey, I want to do self-care December and we're going to do something for ourselves like every day for 31 days. And just like, and like, I journaled about my, I don't know if they journaled about theirs, but I like journaled about mine and just like doing something for myself every day for 31 days, which is like, wow. Like I didn't realize I can give myself this much love. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was amazing. So I've done it quite a few times since then. And so on my Instagram, um, um, I will share that link for you to post with my autobiography. Um, but on my Instagram, um, I post like I did, I posted the 31 days that I did for Christmas. And I recently just did one in August. Um, so I did um, another 31 day, like self care type of thing. And um, I find doing those periodically, like it's nothing that I feel like I can sustain for 12 months out the year, just like thinking about doing something for myself every day. But I think it makes you appreciate the little things that you do. So, you know, just getting up in the morning and cooking myself breakfast. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm really like 
caring about myself right now. Like I got up to fix breakfast. I had to get up like 30 minutes early just so I can make sure I can do it before I leave the house. Um, you know, so like just doing those type of things for myself, like give me those little moments. So I think everyone should have a self-care journey. Um, my chosen way is that's what, you know, I love to talk about. And right now I have a series of four t-shirts out and all of them just talk about like different and they all represent like a different phase that I was in in my self-care journey um and so I just hope like to continue that conversation and to continue to provide those spaces to talk about like mental health and self-care awesome um so can we switch gears not too much but just a little bit and talk about inspirations and aspirations um who are some of the people who inspire you? Why? You don't have to know them personally. Like they could be deceased or still living. And how these people influence your current aspirations and what are your aspirations? So inspirations. Um, I feel like my biggest inspiration would be my grandmother. Um, she passed two days before my high school graduation. And I don't know. I think she was more excited about the entire thing than I was. She was excited about me graduating high school. She was excited about me going to college. And um, I spent a lot of my high school years in and out of like hospitals with her because she was really sick um, and you know, problems with heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, like all the things that affect, you know, the African-American community like we had to deal with. Um, we went through with her. Um, but you know, she was just always so supportive. She wanted to be at everything. It didn't matter what it was. She wanted to be, if it was an award ceremony, she wanted to be there. Um, if I was, I don't know, presenting something, she wanted to be there. Like she was super supportive. Um, and then I think it just translated to just like other people in my family. And so I think she like set that framework for everyone else to like be supportive. And so she was definitely my biggest inspiration. Like I feel like everything that I do, I'm like, I'm doing it because I want to do it, but I'm also doing it because I'm like, I want to make her proud because I want her to, if she was here, I would want her to be able to say like, this is my granddaughter and I am so proud of everything that she's doing. So definitely my biggest inspiration. Um, a person that I use for inspiration, um, E.T., I think his name is Eric Thomas. I think, but well, I don't know. He's E.T. on YouTube and he has this one, uh, segment that he does and it's like I can I will I must and I literally listen to that like if I'm going to take a test he's that's playing in my car like twice before I get to take my test if I'm like needing to get up and do something and I'm like not feeling it like I turn it on and I just connect so much to it um and it just like inspire me so much I'm like okay I, I have to do this like I can do this I will do this I must do this um and so that's like I would love to meet him one day like you know because I just feel like he's just so I don't I feel his passion through like the screen when I'm watching YouTube I'm just like I can feel this passion and I feel like um you know it has helped me a lot so I would definitely love to meet him one day um other inspirations I don't know like all of my friends are inspirations like you like Aurora's my friend so you know hey it's that's that um, <laughs> but no like uh we especially like the group that i'm um we came together in undergrad and i just feel like like all of you all just inspire me you know i'm like oh my gosh they're out here changing the world like they're doing things and you know they're following their dreams and they're gonna just make this huge impact and and i just feel like i'm like okay i have to do the same thing like i have to like we're all friends for a reason. Like, you know, like they push me, I push them. And so, um, so definitely my friends, um, inspire me, uh, my aspirations to be a doctor. Um, but no, uh, yeah. So I want to, I do want to be a doctor. I'm currently applying into medicine and pediatrics because I want to care for children and I want to care for adults. And I want to be in a setting to where providing that continuum of care um, from childhood to adulthood um, and making developing those relationships with my patient population. But I also want to be in a position in life where I am engaged with the community that I serve. So continuing my community involvement, continuing my advocacy 
um, continuing my mentorship. Like those are the things like, yes, I want to be a doctor. I, I know that I am absolutely going to love a career as a doctor, but the things that keeps me going are the things that are important to me. So the community engagement, the advocacy, the mentorship, and some those things have to be a part. Of, those things are part of my aspirations now. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And do you see yourself staying in the Northeast or are you just open to where you go? Or are you trying to get back to the South? I would love to be somewhere where it doesn't snow. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm open to living anywhere. I feel like I can find my community um, in places. And I think that's the important thing is just like finding that community. Um, but I also would love to be closer to family because family is important to me. Like that's a big thing. And like having, having to get on a plane to just see my family versus like taking a five hour road trip is, you know, it's completely different and it makes the biggest difference. Um, and so I'm pretty much open to wherever I end up. Um, I will be happy. Um, but yeah, I think it's the snow. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, <laughs> that's why I'm trying to make my journey, you know, <laughs> a little, little more south, maybe below the Mason-Dixon. But, you know, just kind of staying open is probably the best thing to do as an early career doctor or just early career, any stage of early career, right? um okay I have like just really enjoyed talking to you I've learned so much you know you my girl but I it's like so many stuff I just didn't know I want to wrap up with if you could travel back in time and write yourself a journal it doesn't be 31 days it could be a day just a day entry that you looked to okay just a day entry that you look back at today and gave yourself some encouraging words or some words that you thought that you needed that you thought would be valuable, immensely valuable today, or just for anyone in your position that you are today, just like on the verge of living their dreams, living their aspirations, helping people, what would, I don't know, I don't want to give your age away, what, what would 10 year older, 10 year younger, what you should say to you today? Uh, it's funny that you asked that because I've actually done this like twice. Okay. Um, <laughs> I encourage, I highly encourage everyone to do this. Like write yourself a letter that you will want to open up in, I don't know, 10 years or so. Uh, so the most recent one, I wrote one to myself when I first started medical school mm -hmm. and I read it, I don't know, a year ago. And when I tell you it was the most impactful thing, because I'm like, wow, like, how did I know? that I would need those words. Mm -hmm. um, but I told myself that I am here for a reason. I worked really hard to get to where I am today. And, um, and even though sometimes I feel like I don't belong in these spaces, I do belong because I've put in the work to be in these spaces. So just believe in myself that I am capable of doing anything um, to reach the goals that I desire. And I know that the journey won't be the easiest, but the hard work will pay off in the end and I will enjoy a career as a future physician. And just make sure that I take care of myself, whether that's taking a day off to cook myself my favorite meal or going to my favorite ice cream place and just eating ice cream, whatever it is that makes me happy to make sure that I continue to do that. And, um, and know that I have a support system. I have people in my corner that is cheering for me and praying for me and they want me to achieve my dreams just as much as I want myself to achieve my dreams. And, um, and in those moments that I doubt that, just reach out to them so that they can provide those encouraging words that I may need to hear in that moment. And to wrap it up, um, my quote, my scripture, Second Corinthians, verse fourteen. Um, just knowing that God's grace is sufficient um, in all times. Amen. 
thank you for sharing with Nisha. It was awesome chatting with you. And of course, I know you're going to be great. And girl, we're going to just continue to do our thing. And I am in your corner. I know like whatever the future holds for you will be absolutely amazing. And I cannot wait to see it. Um. <laughs>